Again, uh, my name is uh, Dr. John R. Taylor, and this is Math uh, 1120, uh, Section 2, and uh, Business Calculus. Now, I've already set up your uh, Canvas page right here, and like I said, I I'm recording these classes, and if you'll notice on your little settings, you don't get to see all the little settings, but on here you'll see a, a bunch of settings, and over here you'll see at the bottom the Panopto recordings. This is where they're going to be housed at. So as I'm videotaping the class and you want to watch an old class video, go to the bottom just below settings and you can click on Panopto recordings and you will see the actual date and, and actually the material that I covered. And today I'm going to be doing section 1.5 and maybe a little bit of section uh, 6.1a and stuff. But um, uh, before we get started with the class, um, first thing I want to do is go over the syllabus. Then we'll talk about the modules, how we have it set up, and the actual pacing guide for this class. And then, of course, the most important thing is we're going to talk about accessing the Hawk system and stuff, which is what we're going to be using in our class as uh, the homework uh, uh, computer system, welcome to the 21st century, of how we actually teach classes and stuff. So instead of, uh, we are going to have some paper and pencil material to turn in as well, but uh, this is a traditional homework sets are now done through the computers. You no doubt have seen this before. And especially guys that took college algebra here, uh, we use the Hawk systems with that class too. And so if you remember your college algebra class, the one big complaint that most students give is ah, there's a lot of work to be done in this class because for every, every section of test we have homework to be done, we have to quote certify, so you want to get at least our cutoff is about 80% of it, so we can move on to the next set. And for every three, two or three uh, sections, we also give you guys a quiz, which is kind of like a web test to make sure you guys understand this stuff. So first off, let's go over here to the class syllabus. Now you can click on syllabus here, or you can click on syllabus here, or you can do like I did and print one out, and we'll go over this thing. So again, uh, my name is Dr. John R. Taylor. My office is upstairs in Fretwell 335A. Uh, my office hours are Mondays and Fridays from 1230 to 1.30, and on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11.30 to 12.30, and also by appointment if you can't make those. And there's my email address and my office phone number. All right, course materials that you guys are going to need. All right, we're doing the Essentials Calculus 2nd Edition Software and Custom Guided Notes. And uh, here's the ISBN number if you want to take that to the uh, bookstore or you can actually order it through Hawks themselves and stuff. But uh, let me also show you what this is. Now, there is a textbook for this class, however, and here's the copy of the textbook. But you guys in the 21st century, uh, you can also purchase the textbook. That'll be an additional price if you're old school and like the, the book. But when you get the little course access stuff, you get an e-book. 21st century crap. Uh, you get an ebook with this particular material and stuff, but if you want the hard one, you know, they actually make that stuff too. And this is what the thing looks like and stuff. So, um, but when you go to the bookstore, what you'll be purchasing is the what we call the set of guided notes. Now, these set of guided notes, and I see a couple of folks already got one of these things out, that basically they are questions and no answers and stuff. And we're going to be going through this thing and you're going to be writing in this particular. Uh, book as well, front and back. And that's exactly what I have up here. I just made mine loosely because it works easier than trying to write in a book, especially on the back pages and stuff like that. So um, this is the book you'll be purchasing, and you'll be purchasing an access code as well. And that access code is uh, very, very important. So once you get into the system, uh, you, the computer will memorize who your access code is and you can get there. So and uh, let me just come over here real quick. And... For me, I mean, I've got this stuff here. I log into the Hawk system here, and once you get your access code, you click on this. One of the wonderful thing about Hawks is also their 24-7 tech support. They also have their 1-800 number that you can call. So if you've got any problems with this material, you call them up, and they will help you out very quickly. And not only do they help the students out, trust me, I'm on the phone with these people all the time. They help the professors out as well. They, they are very, very nice folks, and the nice thing about it is uh, they get the stuff done quickly, and, uh, and they're just a great, great company to work with. And um, also, you got uh, your Hawks Visits Hall system uh, to download the software, 
and to purchase your access code and all the stuff if you want it there. You also can purchase it at our bookstore when you buy the little booklet and stuff. They give you the access code there as well. So I try to set up all the little links here for you. And But what you'll do is once you get your access code is click on this thing over here. And, uh, and the first time you'll have to create the account, but I've already got an account. And it's usually based upon uh, your email address and then you put your own password in there. And I've already done that. And so here's what the Hulk system looks like. And um, so I'll go ahead and go through the Hulk system, uh, what's due and stuff here, and you can go view the course. So we click on view the course here. And let's, I guess I've got to sign in again because I clicked on some buttons. Let's see, view the course. There we go. And um, so due within a week, um, we've got uh, their lines and graphs. That's what we're actually doing today. Uh, lines and graphs in uh, section uh, 1.6a. I'm lucky I'll get to that. If I don't, I'll pick it up uh, on Friday and stuff. Uh, but uh, click on this thing here. And what you got is, again, for you people that have not done HALTS, I'm talking to the choir, if you've done HALTS, which most of you guys have, you've got a learn mode, and this is where your videos and stuff like that is, and they will actually go through some examples with you and stuff, which is kind of what I do in class. But HALTS has also set up their own little system to help you out. The big deal is, is you want to uh, practice some homework problems and stuff, uh, and, and but you know, and again, we strongly encourage you guys to practice this stuff because the big deal over here is the certify. This is really your homework set, and this was what goes down in the grade book is your certify, and we set the mastery level at uh, eighty-three percent. It's around eighty percent depending on the number of questions and stuff. So, and you click on basically start, and all of a sudden, in this one, they got twenty-three questions. And you have got to sit there and go through and answer all the questions and you submit your answers and stuff. And again, you've got a problem, no problem at all. Uh, obviously, you come to me, come to Saunders. Also, you've got your Hulk support system as well, especially if there's a computer problem that something's not working for you guys, contact those guys, okay? But the certify is honestly the, the big deal that you're going to be focused on in each one of these sections. Now, so each section that we cover, you're going to have to do the certify. And this is the one that, again, students complain about, but we know. But the more practice you do, the better off you're going to be. Because my goal here is I'm still looking for that class that I would like to issue everybody in the class an A. It hasn't happened yet, but I'm getting close. So, and but to do the Hulk system, if you do this stuff, trust me, my tests are going to come directly off of this certify, off of, off of the, the problems that you do in class, the problems we do in class together, and off the uh, uh, homeworks that have been set up through the Hulk system and stuff. You won't be surprised by anything I put on the test. But here's the deal. After we do a couple, about two or three sections each week, we actually, at the end of the week, you'll see we're going to um, actually make you guys have a, uh, basically, a web test. It's called a quiz. And it's going to be the quiz on those particular sections. And there's about 10 questions or whatever, 10, 15 questions. You basically do those things, and that goes down like a mini test. And we're going to do, you know, for every three of them, so it's like 11 of these things. But we're going to have chapter tests in here as well. So let me go back over here to the uh, syllabus, and we'll talk more about that. All right. So prerequisite for the class is Math 1100 or Math 1103, which is college algebra or pre-calculus. Um, and you had to have a C or better to get in this class. Uh, we're on a 10-point grading scale because we're college. And uh, here's how I've got the uh, course basically laid out for you guys in terms of percentages. Okay. The Hulk's lessons. So every section we do, you have that certified thing to do. Okay. That's going to make up 20% of your grade. And then you've got the online quizzes for about every two or three sections that we cover. You're going to have a, a, what we call a web test, a quiz. And that's going to make up, and we have, like I said, 11 of these guys on there. And uh, those things are typically due, uh, will be starting on Friday and going through Saturday. So I've set up pretty much two days for you guys to do your test, typically on the weekend to get these things done. All right. And that will make up uh, another 20% of your grade. You will have chapter tests. Now, Here's the way we're starting this thing out, because we're going to go through Chapter 6. Chapters, we do ha we start Chapter 1.5, so we do kind of half of Chapter 1, and then we do all of Chapter 2. So I put a test at the end of Chapter 2. So you've got to end a test in Chapter 2, a test in Chapter 3, a test in Chapter 4, a test in Chapter 5, and a test in Chapter 6. That makes the five tests, okay? And then, of course, and that makes up 30% of your grade. 
and um, and I'm going to do a classic format that we'll have, uh, you know, a percentage that will be multiple choice, but I'm also going to have free response for you guys to turn in because I want to see your work on this stuff and show you how you guys do the work. So it's not 100% free response like the um, web tests and stuff like that are. And then, of course, you have the, God help you, cumulative final exam, which is required by all math departments. And so um, we're going to have, it's, it's worth 30% of your grade. And for us, the final exam is going to be on May the 3rd from 8 until uh, 1030. So go ahead and mark your calendars on that one. That's Friday. And I'm going to, again, guesstimating because I haven't made a final exam yet, but it'll be about 50 questions. You've got two and a half hours on this thing. And it's going to be a combination of multiple choice with some of that free response I was talking about. And, and, and it's cumulative, so it covers the entire vast of the class and stuff. Okay? So there's the big stuff. Um, Attendance policy. There is an attendance policy. You're in college, therefore you're expected to show up for every class. We will have class. We will have assigned seats, and if you have more than three absences, excused or unexcused, your grade will be lower by a letter grade. Let's talk about math. What is the definition of more than three absences? Where do you start at? Four. Right. Okay. So more than three means that you're in three. You're still in good standing here. It's four or more, because if you miss three classes, you've already missed a week of this stuff. You can't afford to miss a week of calculus. Everything we do builds on the next day, which builds on the next day. So once you miss a day, you've got a gap in your understanding. Now, granted, I'm doing something special for you guys. I'm videotaping my lectures, so it'll be easier for you guys to kind of get caught back up. But even then, university policy, and this is actually coming from Chapel Hill in the UNC system, that all college, all classes have to have an attendance policy, and this one's ours. So if you've got more than um, uh, three absences, your grade will be lower by a letter grade. And if you have more than five, define more than five for me, please. Six or more, uh, well, that's two weeks of classes. Uh, well, if you're failing anyway, you might as well just go ahead and make it official. Uh, you will have to repeat the class. You're expected to... Uh, be on time and stay to the end of every class. Arriving late or leaving early will be counted as absence. It is very important for uh, you to never miss class for any reason. However, if you do miss a class, it is your responsibility to get the notes from someone other than me in class. Watch the video here, here, on my class here, and understand the material on your own. You, you can't afford to miss class. You've got to come here because, you know, granted, the videos are great that I'm making for you guys, and it's really hopefully will help you guys out, and you'll see a real love for this stuff. But the fact is, you, you actually get to see me up here. The beauty of the video is, the video is only in the doc cam. You hear my voiceover, and you'll see me write a bunch of problems up here. You actually never get to see me, but you guys get to see me because I want, you want to see my, I want to see your reaction and my reaction when I'm emphasizing this stuff. Because calculus is real important. For you guys, for most of you guys, this class, calculus and statistics, are the last two math classes you got, before we launch you guys into your majors. So most of you guys are be business majors, but I also have some criminal justice majors in here. I may have some nursing majors and some other majors as well. But most of you guys are in business majors and stuff. And you understand, when you guys get into that curriculum, they're going to expect you to know this stuff. And they're not going to go over it with you again. They're going to take that and move on and apply it to whatever topics they're discussing and stuff. So we'll be doing a lot of you know, business applications. All right. Um, uh, study policy and tutoring, additional learning opportunities. Well, uh, well also on the uh, third floor fretwell, we have the uh, walk-in tutoring and math uh, learning center. Uh, and and uh, like I said, on the third floor, right across from the math department. Uh, also, we have um, SI. I, I'm, I'm working on trying to get them to have some SI supplement instruction. But uh, basically, that will be announced if we can get that thing going the Academic Excellence Center, but also with the Academic Excellence Center, you can also sign up for up to one hour a week free tutoring. That will get you a one-on-one -on -one tutoring person to work with you guys on that particular stuff. But again, you've got to go over to, it's over in Covart, you've got to sign up for it, okay? And uh, you can get one-on-one -on -one tutoring. When you go to the third floor math department, uh, third floor in the, in the, at Math Resource Center up there, um, the deal with that is it's open tutoring. You walk in there, you sit down, and you start basically working problems. If you've got a question, you raise your hand. Grad student comes over there and helps you out. 
and then when they're done with you, they'll run and help out somebody else, and you raise your hand again, and then they'll come back to you. So it's not constant. It's basically kind of a open door tutoring type thing here. And of course, you have me as a resource, and for us, you also have Sonda, my, my, my assistant. She's also going to be taking uh, you know, role based on your assigned seats and stuff. So uh, this is the first day of class, and typically because of drop ad, we're not going to take role the first day or so, but we are going to start assigning seats for you guys as we get this day, this class laid out and stuff like that. So you know, be prepared for that. Uh, academic integrity, uh, read your uh, college handbook on academic dishonesty. dishonesty. Um, others, uh, please turn off any electronic devices. The only electronic device you need to have in this class is the calculator. I will be using a TI-84 calculator. Um, that's, uh, and I'll show you some wonderful tricks and some programs on this particular calculator. This is the one I should suggest you have. TI-83 slash 84. If you got 83, that's the older version. The buttons are in the same spot. The only difference is 84's got a little, it's a newer, newer system and it's got a little more memory to it. But uh, the 83 works exactly the same way and I can show you the buttons on that one as well. So TI-83 slash 84. Okay, but other than this type of electronics, any kind of fun cell phones, you got to turn them off. Any kind of uh, uh, you know, eye watches, crap like that. Anything like that, it's got to be put away, especially uh, during test time and stuff like that. But it's uh, like I said, disruptive to other students. That also include, uh, includes computers. <laughs> now, for the you know, where we got the Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. So for the 50 minutes that you guys have me in here. Uh, you got to be full attention up here. I don't want to see your computer, uh, laptops open, unless you know I, I ask you know, if you got a particular question that Hawks is doing and you couldn't answer it and stuff, and you need to access, ask me a question. That's fine, but then sl shut the computer uh, table down. I don't want to see a bunch of laptops and all I get to see is the back of them because I don't actually know what you're actually watching in here. You should be watching, working on the mathematics and stuff. So turn all electronic devices off. Okay. And uh, the last thing on my uh, syllabus here is I've tried to give you guys a day-by-day uh, a -day description of what I'm going to be going. And the key word to this is the word tentative. So, you know, this is my goal is to actually um, uh, lay out what I'm supposed to be covering each and individual day here. And uh, so I'm supposed to be introducing myself going over 5.1 and 6.1a. But I knew I may be running over, so I could also put 6.1a over here on the next day, too, so I can get myself caught up. But this, this will at least give you, you know, uh, when, um, you know, the tests are going to be due and to kind of give you guys, like I said, it's a pacing guide of what we're going to be doing every different day of, of the class and stuff like that. But the key word is it's tentative. Some days I may slow down a little bit, make sure you're understanding stuff. Don't worry, we got plenty, tons of time in this class. Some days I may speed up because I think you guys got this stuff down so I can speed up and then I can spend some more time on other topics and stuff. So it, it's a very tentative schedule. All right. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on today's lecture. Now, the way the Hawk system is set up is, uh, you know, they have, and I can go over here and kind of show you at least where the little icons are at and stuff like that. Under the learn mode over here, when you start, you can also access their videos. And there's, some, like I said, some pre-section videos. And we strongly encourage you guys watching this type of stuff and things like that. And then after you watch this, then you're supposed to practice. And the practice is really just one thing. And you practice as much or as little as you need. Uh, we strongly recommend that you pre-certify practicing problems first because these problems under the practice are just like the ones you want to certify. The certify is where you get your point totals. So the ultimate goal is to get to the homework set over the certify. And the goal is to get at least 83%. And you get to take it as many times as you want. But uh, try to get above 83% because once you're above that, that allows you to move on into the next section. The key to this class is very simply one thing. Don't procrastinate. Procrastination will kill you in a class like this, especially as, as much material as we're covering and we're moving through the syllabus accordingly. You can't fall behind. You got to get your homework sets done. You got to get the quizzes done because, like I said, that's a, a test. After, uh, after you, we've done a two or three of these uh, uh, sections and stuff to make sure you're mastering this particular material. That's the key. Don't fall behind. You've got stuff to do in this class. Every day we're in class and stuff to do, like I said, on the weekends and stuff. So there you go. All right. 
So, if you watch the video, which I think some most people haven't gotten their codes yet or whatever, so I'm going to help you guys out with this first part here. All right. First one, we're going to start with section 1.5. Why? Because I know you guys have seen lines before. It's a big topic in uh, college algebra and pre-calculus and stuff, but you're going to see it again in a, a, a calculus because we do things like the equation of tangent lines and talk about the meaning behind these type of things. So lines are going to be real important. So in terms of the line material and, and, and the like, uh, I'm just going to go through and uh, basically start with what we call it. This is the learn mode. So if you watch the uh, video uh, in terms of what Hawks has set up with, with you guys, basically they go through and answer some of these big questions. And it's, remember, for a big part of this stuff, there's a lot of reminder stuff. In the Cartesian coordinate system, um, two perpendicular number uh, lines called axes are uh, used to separate a plane into four watt. Now, so again, just getting terminology is all we want. So these are your axes, your x and y axis. What are these guys called? They're four watt quadrants. Four quadrants. And they're labeled. This is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. You go counterclockwise. Okay. The point where the two axes intersect, which is right here, is called the what? Or just this is just a little big big time review. Origin. Okay. You know, I know again, reviewing your out college algebra deal, so don't don't be offended by this. Uh, a first degree equation in uh, x and y is called a what? When you have a first degree, it means x to the first power equation with plus a y to the first power. Well, um, that's called, what section are we in? Good, it's called a line, okay, and it's called a linear equation to be with the fancy term here. A linear equation. Okay. Now, a linear equation, a uh, slope of a line that measures, excuse me, the slope of a line is a measure of the steepness of a line. And lines with a positive slope slant which way? If you've got a positive slope, it slants up like this, which means it slants upward. And a negative slope slants downward. Now, this concept, the way this thing slants, basically tells you a lot of things about what, what's going on with the particular line. When it's sloping upward, the bigger X's you put in gives you the bigger Y's. If it's sloping downward, the bigger X's you put in, the smaller the Y's that you get. So, okay. And just to remind you guys, horizontal lines. Just to draw a horizontal line, it looks like this. What kind of slope does the horizontal line have? I right, good. Zero slope. Horizontal lines have zero slope. However, vertical lines, lines that go up and down, have they see slope that is undefined. We basically say no slope. Okay? Does that make sense? Horizontal lines have zero slope. Uh, vertical lines have does not exist slopes. Uh, positive slopes go up like this. Negative slopes go down like this because you read a graph from left to right. Okay? Now, this is math class, so it doesn't take too long for us to get a formula out of this thing. Okay? So, slope, M, that's our standard letter for slope. What's the formula for slope? Do you guys remember? I can hear crickets in here. Oh, you guys studied over Christmas, I see. Excellent. Right. What's the formula for slope? Now, you got two points, x1, y1, that would be the first point, and you got a second point. We'll call him x2, y2. How do I calculate the slope? Change in y over the change in x, which by formula is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now that's my formula, but this is a calculus class, so I'm going to start throwing some calculus concepts at you guys. This is my formula, y2 minus y1 is the change in y. Now in calculus, we have classic symbols for everything. What is the symbol for change in calculus? Okay, <laughs> delta, <laughs> you're good. Triangle, yes. Delta, in Greek letters, we've got to pick on the Greeks because a lot of the stuff, math we do, has a lot of history behind it. We blame the Greeks on this one. Delta. It's delta Y over 
delta x. And we'll see this concept again. So this is the mathematical formula, change in y over the change in x. Delta in mathematics stands for change. Okay. All right, in terms of lines, parallel lines. All right, parallel lines look like this. Parallel lines have slopes that are what? Very good, equal. They're going in the same direction. That slope is basically giving you the direction. So when you have parallel lines, you have the same direction, a.k.a. they have the same slope. However, perpendicular lines, perpendicular lines are lines that meet at 90-degree uh, angles, okay? They have something called what? Perpendicular lines have slopes that are negative reciprocal. Now, what exactly is a negative reciprocal? So if I tell you I have a slope of two-thirds, now the international symbol for perpendicular is an upside-down T. It meets that little 93 mark I think there. What would the perpendicular slope be? The parallel lines have the same slope, but uh, perpendicular lines have negative reciprocal. Negative reciprocal means you flip the fraction and change the sign. So what would its slope be? Very good. Negative three halves. Okay? And so, just to throw some more at you, if I have a slope of five, what would the perpendicular slope be? Okay, every, every number every number can be written as a fraction by sticking them over one. So flip it and then change the sign. That would be negative one-fifth. Now, one more. If the slope is zero, what would the perpendicular slope be? We just talked about this. A slope of zero means it is a horizontal line. What's perpendicular to horizontal? Vertical. And vertical line, which means the slope is undefined. And just to remind you of some things there, so that negative reciprocal concept. All right? Now, there are standard three forms of lines that you need to know. Now, out of these guys, you have the standard form, the slope-intercept form, and the point-slope form. These are your big three. So here you get my big lecture on this stuff here. So here's the deal. St the, out of these three, one that most people remember is which one? Which one do you guys remember? If I ask you, hey, give me an equation of a line, give me a formula for an equation of a line, what, is, what do most people tell me? Outstanding. Y equals MX plus B, because that's the one we remembered even from high school and junior high school, because we beat that one in our heads. And that's an important one. It's called the slope-intercept form. The slope-intercept form is that famous Y equals MX plus B. But here's the deal. As important as that line is, it only has two purposes in life. What are the two purposes of the slope-intercept form? You do two things, one or two things. You can read off data. You got it. Interpret data. Read off data. Okay. What I mean by read off data is this. If I give you um, the line y equals 3x plus 2, the slope is 3, it's the number in front of the x, and the y-intercept is 2. You read off data. And the other thing we do with this stuff is we use it to graph. Because the y-intercept is 2, I can put a dot there. The uh, slope is 3, make it a fraction, 3 over 1. And then I can do the famous rise over run, rise 3, run 1, put another dot, and then connect my dots, and I got my equation of a line. So we do two things with the slope-intercept form. So it is a very important equation, but it is not the most important equation. And this is the amazing thing for people who do algebra and then calculus. The most important equation of a line, and so let me emphasize that once again, the most important equation of a line is the one that nobody ever remembers. And that equation of a line is called point-slope formula. The point-slope formula is the formula y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. This is the most important equation of a line. Okay, why? Because of this. To use the point-slope formula, you've got to have two things. 
you've got to have a point and a slope. We're math people, so don't think too deep in how we come up with stuff. Okay? Point, slope. You've got to have a point and a slope. It only has one purpose in life. The one purpose in life is this. Find the equation of the line. That is the only purpose it has. Find the equation of a line. But if you look at 90 some odd percent of the questions we ask you about lines, the first words on any question about lines is, find the equation of a line that does something or other. So this is why this is the most important one, because anytime you hear the words, find the equation of a line, this is the dude you use. Point, slope, formula. You've got to have two things. You've got to have a point and a slope. You plug the point in for the uh, x1 and the y1, you plug the slope in for m, and then you can put it in any form you want. There's one other form of equation of a line, and that is called the general form, or standard form, general form or standard form. The general form or standard form is ax plus by equals c, where a, b, and c are integers. Typically, a is going to be a positive integer. And what's the purpose in life for this guy? It has one purpose in life. It looks good. There is no purpose in life for this guy except for it's nice to write it as 3x plus 4y equals 5. When you're, when you're typing up mathematics or typing up any kind of project form, it looks good to put the form in ax plus by equals c. Other than that, it has no real purpose. Okay, You don't really use it. But remember, a, b, and c are typically integers, and you put it in this form, a is going to be a positive integer. That will actually make these A's, B's, and C's unique when you put, and make sure A's positive integer. Okay? Okay? Now, the next thing I want you guys to do, and I'm not going to do this one, is you, under the, um, and again, have a complete set of notes, I want you guys to go, when you guys get your uh, certificate, your, your, your access code, go under the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the lesson, uh, the, the learn mode, um, they actually have a video, and they've done a couple of problems for you guys on this one, and they, they do this problem here. So I'm not going to do this problem. I want you to do it, and then go watch the video and see if you guys got the right answer. I want to get you really behind this Hulk system stuff on the way they're, they're teaching you guys to learn this stuff. So we're going to do the practice problems, all right? Taking all the stuff we just talked about, and again, for us, a lot of this is reminder when I need to actually uh, give you guys some information. Trust me, I will. So here we go. Let's do some practice problems here. It says this. Find the slope determined by the ordered pairs, negative 2, 4, 7, negative 3. And these problems right here are the exact same style of problems you're going to see in that certify your big homework that gets recorded in part of your big grade there. So first off, it says find the slope. All right, well, we're math. If I'm looking for something right, I'm going to look for a formula. What is the formula for slope again? It was y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay? This is x1, this is y1, this is x2, this is y2. First point, second point. So I just plug in my numbers. y2, which is negative 3, minus y1, which is 4, divided by x2, which is 7, minus x1, which is negative 2. Change in y over the change in x. Now, Clean it up. Minus 3, minus 4. What you got? Negative 7. Divided by 7 minus negative 2. A minus a minus makes it a what? Plus. And 7 plus 2 is 9. So the answer is negative 7 over 9 or negative 7 ninths. That is my slope. What is this slope telling me? Well, it is negative, which means when I start looking at the line that connect these two points, that slope would be going down because it's negative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Determine the slope and the y-intercept of the line. y equals negative 3 uh, fourths x minus 2. This is a giving here. So, here we go. Now, anytime I'm looking for slope and y-intercept, we call that the slope-intercept form. Slope-intercept form is y equals mx plus b. And in this example, Merry Christmas, they gave you the equation exactly in that form. It is solved for y. Look, look what they gave you. y equals 
negative 3 fourths x minus 2. Helm is the slope, okay? And the slope is the uh, coefficient in front of the x, which in this case would be y. Negative 3 fourths. B is that y-intercept, and the y-intercept is, sign goes with it, negative 2. And if you want to view the y-intercept as a point, you would write it as 0, because x is 0, y is negative 2. Does that make sense? The B is negative 2, that's your y-intercept. But as a point, because it is a y-intercept as a point, is the point 0, comma, negative 2. Does that make sense? But this was a nice one. But so, I reserved the right to throw different problems at you. Same direction. What if they gave me this? 8x minus 7y is equal to you know, 14. Same direction. To find the slope and the y-intercept. The problem is, this equation is in what they call standard form. But to be able to figure out the slope and y-intercept, you've got to read off the data. Now, how many times have I had students sit there and tell me, oh, the slope is 8 and the y-intercept is uh, negative 7? Wrong. Because you're in the wrong form. This is standard form. You've got to put it in slope-intercept form to read off the data. And an easy way to remember slope-intercept form is, I just solve the thing for y. Get y by himself. So to go for that slope, you know, again, this is standard, just getting used to our terminology. We're going to turn it into y equals mx plus b, which is your slope-intercept form. I'm going to solve this thing for y. So all we get for y, I'm going to get the y by himself. I'm going to subtract 8x from both sides. That's going to give me negative 7y is equal to negative 8x plus 14, because moving the 8x cancels it out, moving it to the other side. Then my last move is, I'm going to get y by himself. I'm going to divide by negative 7. What I do to one term, I do to all terms. So divide by negative 7 on all sides. And clean him up. And what? What's the careless error? So this cancels. Leaves me with y equals negative 8 divided by negative 7 is 8 sevenths x. And 14 divided by a negative 7. Positive 14 divided by a negative 7 is a minus 2. Does that make sense? Now, answer the questions. What's the slope? 8 sevenths. And the y-intercept is, once again, it's negative 2. And you can write that as the point 0, negative 2. Does that make sense? See, this was nice in this form, but trust me, they never give it to you in that form. They always do this kind of mess to you and make you jump through some hoops. But you've got to put it in slope-intercept. When you've got to read off data, that's where you want the slope-intercept form. Okay? Now, the next question is one of these uh, standard questions on this. Determine if the line um, 5x minus 4y equals 15 contains the point negative 3, 0. Basically, this is a check kind of a question. Your point, here is your x, is negative 3, your y is 0. We're going to check. Check, you're going to plug it in. The equation is... 5x minus 4y equals 15. So this would be 3 times x is negative 3 minus 4 times y is 0. And the question, does that equal 15? If the answer is yes when you plug it in, then it contains the point. If the answer is no, you get a false statement. The answer is no, it does not contain the point. Does that make sense? So we're checking. So 3 times negative 3 is negative 9, minus 4 times 0 is 0. Does that equal 15? Does negative 9 equal 15? No, it does not. The answer is no. So, does it determine whether the point uh, contains the point? The answer is no, no, it does not. If it was equal to 15, the answer would have been yes. I'm sorry, you did 5x instead of 3x? Oh, wait a minute. You're right, thank you. I skipped over 5x, thank you. What's 5 times negative 3? I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> negative 15. I didn't look at the math. Does negative 15 equal 15? No, still, the answer is no. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I kind of looked up and looked down. I wasn't paying attention to my numbers. Watch the careless errors. So I'm going to let you know right now. Okay, first day of class, you caught me in a careless error. You know what the difference between me doing these problems up here and you guys doing these problems? It's real simple. I graduated. 
They're not going to take away my doctorate degree because I screwed up some basic math. They, once you graduate, it's yours for life. You've got to earn this stuff. I've already earned this thing. Just watch me. We, we work these problems together. Now, again, I'm going to pick on you guys, and I love cracking jokes in class and stuff, but I'm telling you the truth. I make careless errors as much as anybody. Ask my wife. She'll let you know. So um, the fact is, uh, you know, watch me because I will. I'm running. I'm actually thinking about the next question on this stuff, and I'm, I'll make a bonehead here or there. But, but hopefully, you're understanding the concept. That's the most important thing. But you've got to prove it to me. You can't afford to make careless errors. <laughs> I can't. All right. So here we go. Look at number four. Find the slope. Find the slope-intercept form of a line passing through the points zero. Passing, passing through the points negative two, comma one. And four negative five. All right. Well, in other English here, we would typically state this as find the equation of a line, but they're telling you what form they want it to be put in. The slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. We want to find the equation of a line. To use the slope intercept form, I got to have two things I got to have a slope and a point. What do they give me? Two points. So I've got the point part covered, okay? So, the other thing I need to have is the slope. So, slope-intercept form here, but to find the equation of a line, find the uh, slope-intercept form of the line, basically, find the equation of a line, you want to use the point-slope formula. And what is the point-slope formula? y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. The most important equation of a line is what you've got to use to find an equation of a line. They're going to make me put it in this form. That's fine. First, we've got to find the line first. So I've got to have a point and a slope. I've got two points, more than enough information, but I've got to have the slope. So the formula for slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This would be y2 is negative 5 minus y1 is 1 over change in x, 4 minus negative 2. Now watch the careless errors and let's do the math. Negative 5 minus 1 is negative 6. For minus negative 2, a minus a minus makes it a plus. 4 plus 2 is 6. Negative 6 divided by 6 is negative 1. So my slope is negative 1. Now, to use the point slope equation, I already got the slope. My slope is negative 1, and I need a point. I got two points, negative 2, 1, and 4, negative 5. Which point am I going to use? Well, honestly, it doesn't matter. Personally, yeah, I'm going to use the point negative 2, 1. You know why? Smaller numbers, less chance for careless errors. Okay? So I'm going to use the easiest of the two points. So I'm going to use the point negative 2, 1. And so when I plug it in, y minus the y coordinate, which is 1, equals my slope, which is negative 1, times x minus the x coordinate, which is negative 2. Notice how I write this stuff in there. I put the numbers with the signs with them. I'll clean it up later. But because this is where careless error occurs at. Okay? So I'm going to clean this guy up because remember, I want to put it in slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. So I want to solve this thing for y. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, that minus minus bothers me. So this is y minus 1 equals negative 1. x minus negative 2 will be x plus 2. Solving for y, my next move is to distribute. So this would give me y minus 1 equals negative x minus 1 times a plus 2 is minus 2. And then I'm going to add 1 to both sides, and I get y equals negative x minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. Just be careful of the careless errors. Careless error kills. Does that make sense? Anytime, and again, watch the wording on this, but traditional wording is find the equation of a line. They'll try to mess you up with some different kind of wording. Find the slope-intercept form of the line. Okay, fine. Still got to find the equation of a line. We have to give them two points. Okay. Number five here says this. Find the equation of a line that is parallel to the line with the equation uh, x plus 2y equals 5 passing through the point negative 4, 2. This is a classic problem. But notice the first words. Find the equation of the line. Right? What am I going to use when I hear the words find the equation of the line? Point slope. My point slope formula is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. I gotta have two things. I gotta have a point and a slope. They gave me the point. So my point is the point negative four, two. 
I gotta have a slope, okay? To have a slope, they gave me the line x plus 2y equals 5. But that's in standard form. To be able to read off the slope, I need to put it in y equals mx plus b. Slope intercept form. I gotta solve it for y. Don't just tell me, oh, the slope is 1 because it's the coefficient in front of the x. It doesn't work like that. You gotta solve it for y first. So I'm gonna subtract x from both sides. That's gonna give me uh, 2y equals negative x plus 5. Then, solving for y, I'm going to divide by 2. What I do to one term, I do to all terms. Divide by 2 on all sides. And I get y equals negative 1 half x plus 5 halves. Now, all I need is the slope. What is the slope of this line? y equals negative 1 half x plus 5 halves. Negative 1 half. Now, we're talking about parallel slopes. Parallel slopes have this, parallel lines have the same slope. So for a parallel line, I would use negative one half. If they change this problem in one word and said, find the perpendicular line, what would the slope I use then? Two. Flip the fraction and change the sign. I would use two. But they just said parallel, so I'm using the same slope. So now my slope is negative one half. So I'm going to plug it in here. And this will be y minus the y coordinate, which is two, equals my slope of negative one half times x minus the, uh, x, uh, the x coordinate, which is negative 4. Notice how I write this stuff in. It, when, uh, you notice I don't try to do the math in my head. I just know the minus minus is a plus. I write it down first. Less chance for careless errors. So now I'm going to clean this guy up. Uh, so this will be y minus 2 equals negative 1 half x plus 4. Minus minus makes it plus. I'm going to distribute the negative 1 half. y minus 2 equals negative one-half x minus one-half times a four makes it a minus two. And then I'm going to add two to both sides and I end up getting y equals uh, negative one-half x minus two plus two is zero and there's my answer. y equals negative one-half x. They did not tell me which form to put it in. So this is actually in slope intercept form. The slope is negative one-half, the y-intercept is zero. If I told you to put it in standard form, well, then I would get rid of my fractions by multiplying it by 2 on both sides. So that would give me 2 times y my equals negative 1 half x. And that's 1 half. And then distribute it, it'll be 2y minus x. I should be 2, excuse me, 2y equals negative x. Because that's an equal to right there. And then I'm going to add x to both sides. And this would be x plus 2y equals 0. This would be the form that would be, quote, unquote, in standard form. I would always pull it to the side with the coefficient in front of the x is positive. And remember, the uh, coefficients in front of the, uh, the x and y must be positive integers. Okay? So there it is. So those are the same thing because they didn't tell me which one for them. So this is Chapter 1.5. Now go get yourself certified on this stuff and go practice this as review. Uh, just one little talk here. 1.6, we're going to be talking about functions and stuff and go ahead and watch the pre-section the, the videos on these things and but we'll go quickly next time and fill out this particular stuff all right study hard and i'll see you guys on friday see you guys in